The 90s were much fun. Rangers had bought nine. They wanted the final one. The summer of 97 was long and bleak. It seemed so long ago on the steps they did speak. The game was over. The Rebels had won. Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Kevin Graham. To my left is Paul John Dykes. Hi Kevin, and today <laughs> we have a very special guest. Someone who was involved in that era and before. Right back into the early 90s when Celtic were in a position of having run out of money and been struggling to make that transition into the modern day football. And the the gentleman to my left was instrumental in Save Our Celts, which was a prelude to Celts for Change. So welcome to the toll booth, Mr Jim Orr. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks for coming along. No bother. The, the podcast, what we tend to do is try and get into your Celtic state of mind. Uh-huh. So if you think back to when you were a, a youngster and uh-huh. your introduction to Celtic, what, what's uh-huh. your early memories? Uh, well, I've, I've actually got a bit of an unusual story uh, compared to most of your guests on here. I only started going to see Celtic in my mid-teens and it was all down to Alfie Cohen. Uh, and basically, before that, I used to play football all the time. I didn't go and watch football. But uh, I think t- uh, mid-70s, I was a big fan of Spurs actually and I uh, always loved the name Tottenham Hotspur White Hart Lane all this stuff and Alfie was the king at that point in time and then when Celtic signed when, when, when Jock signed Alfie Cohen I thought I need to go and see Alfie Cohen and uh, my big mate Stevie who's on sadly no longer with us uh, he'd been to Parkhead a few times like me he played football all the time we didn't go to the football but he knew where Parkhead was so we ended up walking to Parkhead and this cold miserable wet Wednesday night to see Alfie that was the plan it was a pilgrimage to see Alfie and we missed, the, I think we missed the first 10 minutes and we're behind the goals, miles from the park. And then about 10 minutes to half time, Alfie scores this just absolute cracker and says, my big man, that's Alfie for you. And then what we did that season, we weren't playing football, we went along once or twice maybe that season. That was the 76, 77 season. And then 77, 78, which was a great season, we ended up going to get a few games, I mean, seven or eight games. And then the 78, 79 season, the 10 men won the league season, we went to quite a few games. And another few mates who, who were quite keen, who, who did go to Celtic games, I ended up going with them. So after maybe 78, 79, 70, 80, I then virtually didn't miss a home game for a while. And uh, the centenary, after the centenary season, I bought a season ticket. And I had a season ticket for uh, a couple of years until I chucked it back. After all the nonsense that was happening, this was my big protest, a pebble in, the, in an ocean. And then when Fergus took over, then I got my season ticket back. And the season ticket I had in 1988 was in the stand or the South Stand as it's called now, because back then there was only the stand, and we were like 10 seats from the director's box. It was like position A, and it was about £160, I think it cost in those days. And then when we went back after the Hamden year, I was in the North Stand, 411, so we're up in the gods. So I lost this, this fantastic seat, but that was a sacrifice worth making to get, to get wee Ferguson. So so that's, that's, that's kind of my story. Mm-hmm. If you go back to the 1977-78 season, I... Um, I've studied that in some depth and uh-huh. it would look as though Steen wasn't backed by the board. Uh-huh. When you look at the signings that he made, having lost Kenny Dalgleish, mm-hmm. having lost Alfie Conn through injury right. uh, and a few others, um, Pat Stanton, for example, through injury, he needed to strengthen the team and they didn't. Was that mm-hmm. the first indication to you as a supporter that this board might have a corrosive effect on Celtic? Not really for me. I mean, I think it came much later for me. I think there was a few pivotal things that really happened in the 80s for me. I mean, I think all... I mean, Celtic as a board never built on the successes of Lisbon, etc, etc. But the big thing for me was, was a couple of things actually in the in the centenary season. One of the reasons I bought a season ticket was the we won the league against Dundee in the centenary mm-hmm. season. Uh, it was Bedlam in that game. And we used to go to the stand and we go to the stand usually about half past two. And in those days, you didn't need a ticket. You just turned up and you paid and that was it. And you get a decent seat in the stand at half two. And we went about two o'clock that particular game and it was bedlam at two o'clock and we were in the back row at the back stand and everyone was standing up and this was about a year before Hillsborough and you're looking across to the to the, to the jungle and that was like guys were kind of flowing and that could very easily be, have been a Hillsborough yeah. so the guys and I thought that we're going to buy a season ticket now so we've got our seat from now on in so so that was a signal and I think the following year uh, was the Morris Johnson debacle and I thought that was such a big sign because the word in the street at the point in time was that Charlie Nick was coming back. And you thought, eh, I'm also a big Scotland fan. I know that you know tends to divide the Celtic support. But that season, Morris Johnson was in fire for Scotland. You know, he was the guy that got us to mm-hmm. Italia 90. Yeah. 
And Charlie Nick coming back with Morris Johnson, there's no way Rangers would have won the league, in my humble opinion. They just scored goals for fun, those two. But we lost out to Morris Johnson. And then the more you look into it, and I'm sure you've looked into that one, Paul, that we seem to be legally we were in the right. And then in terms of UEFA rules, we were in the right. But we lost them. You know, and that to me was that as soon as he wants to, he'll just march in here and take who he wants. And I think if we'd have got Morris Johnson, nine in a row wouldn't have happened. It would have been stopped at that point. But the other big thing for me was if you fast forward another year, we're in the cup final in 1990, the one we lost in penalties with Anton Rogan. Yeah. About a week or two before that, they brought Brian Dempsey and Michael Kelly onto the board, if you recall. After they, after they didn't get Mo Johnson, I did what a lot of guys do. You write to the papers and you phone Clyde and the fanzines and stuff like that. But you're basically howling at the moon at the end of the day. The only way you'll get change is actually not to go anymore, to deny them your, your kind of cold hard cash. So when they brought Dempsey and Kelly on the board, you thought, OK, this is good. They've actually made some progress here because you knew Michael Kelly, ex-Lord Provost of Glasgow, Glasgow's miles better. So you think this guy knows what he's doing from a marketing point of view. They brought Dempsey on, who you didn't really know, but you knew he was a property guy, you knew he had a plan. So that was, that was, that was really good. OK, so hopefully, let's, let's, hopefully things will get better. You fast forward to the League Cup semi-final later that year, maybe September, october something like that. We beat Dundee United, played really well, we're in the final. And uh, back in the day, I mean, you guys are obviously young guys like yourselves. Internet, emails, Facebook, Twitter, blah de blah. I mean, there was no communication back there. So to find out who was getting cut final tickets, you had to buy the Celtic View. And when I'd bought the season ticket, I'd actually spoke to the person. And I was asking them, how many season tickets do you have? And it was less than 5,000. And I was number something like 3,800. So you buy the Celtic View for the cup final tickets... And it's got all this bump about this supporters club and that supporter club. And season ticket holders, 1 to 3,000, you'll get a ticket. And I'm staring at this thing thinking, what do you mean 1 to 3,000? You know, we've only got 25,000 uh, tickets for the cup final, but all the season tickets, all 5,000 of them aren't getting a ticket. So I went bonkers at this. And those were the days where you would do anything to get to a cup final. You mm-hmm. need to get a ticket, etc. So I raised to Jack McGinn, who's at that point the chairman, and I, and I guess most it was bonkers letter back from Jack McGinn saying, what about the fans in Ireland? What about the fans in London? Fans in the Highlands? So I wrote to him again. And I said, look, you know, fair enough, but I'm a season ticket holder. And back then, as you'll know yourself, the chances are that if, if, you, if you had a bad season, because you paid at the gate, once you got to maybe February or March and you had a bad season, the crowd just tailed off. You buy a season ticket, you're committing for the whole year. Mm-hmm. And I was making these points to Jack McGinn. And I sent him a cheque for 12 quid because it costs £6 to get into the, into the cup final and if you get extra allocation Jack keep me in mind type of thing and at the same time you're doing lots of other things obviously to try and get a ticket for the final and I wrote to Michael Kelly and I wrote to Brian Dempsey so these are the guys on the board these guys will know what they're doing they'll understand this and I sent him a copy of the Jack McGinn letter to say this is ridiculous you know and here's a cheque for 12 quid and if you manage to get a couple of tickets keep me in mind type of thing so Michael Kelly comes back to me and he says uh, I understand the points you make, Jim, very good, blah blah it's, diff- it's kind of difficult for us, 25,000, difficult to do. But I'll tell you what, I, I don't have my allocation yet, I'll hang on to your cheque. And you're thinking, oh, that's good. I get the moment back from Jack McGinn, and Jack McGinn says, there's your cheque back, beat it, basically, you know, so that's no good. And I get the Brian Dempsey one, I'm going to open the letter to Brian Dempsey, the cheque falls out, and I'm thinking, he's the same as Jack McGinn. And then the letter from Brian Dempsey says, uh, Jim, blah 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 you make a lot of really good points, Here's my phone number. Give me a call next week. And I'm thinking, I'm going to phone Brian Dempsey. I'm going to sort the problem out. And he said, and here's, uh, and he said, I don't have my allocation yet, but once I get it, I'll send you on two tickets for my compliments. And you're thinking, I'm in love with Brian Dempsey. <laughs> Brian Dempsey is God. This is great. And then sure enough, the next week, I get two tickets for Michael Kelly. And I get two complimentary stand tickets for Brian Dempsey. I don't know if you recall that game, but it poured that game. Right. And we were in the stand. And over in... So, so that was my kind of first contact with Brian Dempsey. And then the Friday before that final, I'm sitting at home and I've told my wife all this stuff about Brian, I'm, I'm, me and Brian are going to sort Celtic's problems. He's my best pal. I'm going to phone him. This will be great. And uh, oh, the, the bit I missed out, sorry, was that I'd also put lots of other irons in the fire to try and get tickets. So Brian Dempsey sent me two, Michael Kelly sent me two, and I get six other tickets from other kind of things I was doing. That's a long story I'll not tell you today. I've got ten tickets. So what I did is I phoned Celtic Park and I knew that the guys round about me didn't have tickets because they're in the same numbers as us, 3,800 and something like that. But I didn't know their names. And you know what it's like when you go to the game, you sit beside the same people and you don't know their names. It's the guy with the yellow jacket, the guy with the wee girl, that, that's all they are. 
So I phoned the switchboard and I said, I gave him the story. I managed to get some extra cup final tickets. Would you mind giving me the, the, the names? Never mind the numbers. The names of the guys around about me. I'm in, say, P20. So the guy in R20 and R21, daddy da. So astonishingly, they gave me the numbers. So I phoned about half a dozen guys and I said, my name's Jim Moore. I'm the guy with, the, with that, those the, the long red hair that sits behind you. I've got some spare tickets for the cup final. And they said, oh, brilliant. So we met them. Uh, in the pub before the game, and I'm handing out tickets to Robin Hood, I'm thinking, there you go, sort of thing. So to get back to the Friday before the Sunday game, Scotsport was always on the Friday night, and unlike now where you can, I mean, you, you, get, you know, tons of information on the net, you want information, you'll get it instantaneously, something happens and you'll know. But back then, back in 1990, you were dependent on the radio, or the papers, once a day thing, or the TV, and Scotsport was on the Friday night, so you're going to watch Scotsport to see what the latest team news is. And I'm sitting at home, and the TV's on, and the sound is down. I think my wife is reading a newspaper or a book, and I'm reading the paper or something like that. And all of a sudden, Brian Dempsey's face poof, jumps up in the telly. And I says, well, that's him. That's the guy I'm going to marry. Yeah, I'm chucking you. <laughs> I'm marrying him, and we're going to solve Celtic's problems. Put the sound up. Sensationally removed from the board. And you're thinking, what? What? And that was actually worse than losing the final. Because it's kind of like, well, losing the final was like losing a battle, but losing Brian Dempsey was like losing the war. At that point, I think he's the he's the guy that's going to save Celtic if anyone's going to save them. So again, you think, well, what we're going to do? You're going to write to the papers. You're going to just howl at the moon again. So I thought, no, no, I'm going to give my season ticket back at the end of the season because I bought it for the season. So I'm not going to stop going. I'll go to the games, but that's me finished. That's my that's me. That's I said my sort of pebble in the ocean. I'm not going to do it. And if you fast forward again, sometime in December, I'm out in the car and uh, Clyde's on uh, phone in, and a guy called Willie Wilson comes on, and he says, I've had enough. I'm starting a campaign. Finish with this law, it's ridiculous. And then on the Monday, I thought, I'm going to phone Clyde. And I phoned Clyde and asked for the guy's number. And I said, he's an, he's, a, he's an old pal of mine, blah, blah, blah. So I get Willie Wilson's number. And I said, I'm right behind you, mate. I said, if you want any help, I said, I'm an accountant, or any admin stuff, sort of thing. And I find, so what then happened was Willie got a few of his mates, I got a few of my mates. Uh, we contacted Jerry Dunbar and not the view. And we had a meeting and trying to figure out what you do next. It's one thing to kind of say we should do stuff it's another thing to actually do it so what do you do how do you do it when do you do it all that kind of stuff so we went to a pub called Sundowners and there was about I don't know about 15 or 16 and decided we would form a committee we'd have a an open meeting we would leaflet the fans because at the end of the day again you're not really sure of what your opinion is compared to the guy over there which might be completely different so the leafleting idea we we did about 5,000 leaflets and we handed them out I think it was a hearts game Freezing cold winter's day, and we thought, well, you can't go too close to the park because maybe you may get huckled <laughs> for handing out leaflets. So we kept quite far back down London Road, and you're handing out these leaflets. And basically, the leaflet says, if you're not happy, here's a here's a PO box number that we that we'd set up. Get in touch, and then we'll see what happens next. And about 300 people got in touch, which I didn't think was that good. But since that, people have told me that was really good from 5,000 mm-hmm. leaflets getting back to it. So we then said, right, we're going to have a public meeting. Right, we'll do that. Again, it's one thing to say, let's do it. How do you do it? Who does it? Who are you going to invite? And uh, so you think the first person you invite is Brian Dempsey. You want to get Brian Dempsey on board. And I've got his phone number. So you think, I'll phone Brian Dempsey. So, so I phone Brian Dempsey. Uh, and you know, Well, in actual fact, after he was sacked, I sent him a letter to say, thanks for the tickets. Really sorry what's happened. It's a scandal. Blah, 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 blah. So I phone Brian Dempsey and I says, this is what we're thinking of doing. We've got this campaign going. We're going to hire shelves and halls because that's the closest to Celtic Park, we'll do it on a Sunday, sometime in the next six or seven weeks, Brian, would you, would you mind coming and talking to them? And he said, nah, no bother, that'd be fine. Do you think, brilliant, because if you get Brian Dempsey on board, the media will be all over this. They want to hear what he has to say. So, Brian then said, do you want to come in for a chat about it? And I said, well, we've got five guys in the committee. So bring the boys in, we'll have a cup of tea, type of thing. And so, so we'll all go see Brian Dempsey. And he, and he said a wee bit about what happened. He didn't say too much. But then he said to us all, do you want to see the stadium? And we're all dead excited. Said, Aye, what's this about the stadium? So at the time, uh, he had plans for Rob Royston. And we go to the next room, and there's a scale model of, of Rob Royston, about eight foot by four foot. And we're all dead excited to see this eight foot by four foot thing. And he's got all the measurements and all the information and all the, and all the, and all the, and all the data. And he says, well, behind the goals, the fans will be right behind the goals. And the furthest point to the back of the stand will be like 30 metres. And then along the side, 30 metres. And we can evacuate the stadium in two minutes and we're going to get a railway coming in and blah de blah de blah and then he said the most bizarre thing and it's always stuck with me because people tend to think Brian Dempsey 
his most famous quote is when they took when when Fergus took over that night and he does the war is over the rebels had won. But the most bizarre thing he ever said was, with this stadium the way it's positioned, at no point will the sun be in the goalkeeper's eyes. <laughs> and it sounded like a Chinese proverb to me. And I've got a bit of an offbeat sense of humour. I couldn't get that out of my mind. You know, at no point will the sun be in the goalkeeper's eyes. You know, this, is, this, is, this is a brilliant stadium then. So we see Brian Dempsey. Brian agrees to come along. We contacted other people. And because of Brian's relationship and the board with Tom Grant and, and, and Jimmy Farrell, he managed to get them to come along. So you're thinking, you've got the board coming. We'd written to the board and uh, Chris White came back straight away saying, I don't think so, you're a bit of an embarrassment. And that kind of summed them up at the time in that you're thinking anyone who's been asked to come along to something, you wouldn't say that. You would just say, well, I'm washing my hair that night or I'm, I'm doing something, no thanks. But to be that confrontational straight away, you're thinking, mm, that's no good. And Terry Cassidy, who'd just been appointed at the time, he wasn't interested at all. I mean, he was a, an interesting figure, very similar to Charles Green, a kind of Northern England gruff, you know, up, up for a fight type of thing. So Terry wasn't coming. But to get Jimmy Farrell and Tom Grant was really good. Jim Craig agreed to come along. So you've got a Lisbon line coming along and Willie Wilson was going to speak. Now, Willie Wilson worked in the railways. Ordinary fan is going to stand up in front of 350 people and speak. That's phenomenal. You know, what a guy to do that. And we get Jerry Dunbar, not the view guy, but Jerry, Jerry's a teacher, so he's used to that kind of stuff. But for Willie to do that was just phenomenal. And we had somebody to cheer it and the person pulled out about a week and a half beforehand. The guy worked in the media, I wouldn't say who it was, but he felt as if if I'd share this thing, then I might be aligned to Celtic fans and that might damage his career, which is fair enough. So we had a list of potential Celtic fans that we could get to, 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 to share it. And I'd seen an article in the Herald a few days ago by Joe Boltrami. For your younger listeners, Joe Boltrami was a really famous Glasgow defence lawyer. So in the 60s and the 70s, if somebody got accused of murder or armed robbery, the word went out, get Boltrami. That's who you get. So I'm the, I'm the kind of organising the guy. So I say, OK, Jim, get Beltrami. Oh, aye, we'll do that. So I phone's up, Beltrami and company, and I'm through to the switchboard. Who's calling? I say, well, can I speak to Mr Beltrami, please? Who's calling? Jim Orr. What's the name of the company? And it sounded bizarre when I actually said out loud, save ourselves. It just sounded like, what? And she said, what? I said, it's a supporters campaign. And I thought at that point, he's not going to answer the phone. And then this big booming voice comes on. It says, Mr. Orr, this is Mr. Mr. Beltrami. We need to get rid of this board and get rid of them now. Da, 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 da. And you thought, well, that's an open door. And he came in and he said, come in and see me tomorrow, half past nine. So I went to go and see Joe Beltrami, who's this larger than life character. You know, he's about eight foot or something. And he was giving me all these stories about the 1950s and Robert Kelly. He should have done this and done that. So that was an open door. So we've then got, you know, we've got enough people we then advertise it. We then tell the tell the newspapers. One of the guys, uh, Dave Ashman, on the committee, so he was the guy responsible for contacting the media. Again, back in the day, it's not like you just stick someone in Facebook, you just stick your email, you be, you set a website up. So Dave's having to get all the contact numbers for all the papers and phone them up and say, save ourselves. We've got a rally on, blah, 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 blah. So it's game on at that point. And then I get a call from superintendent, somebody from East End of Glasgow. Jim Moore, aye, save ourselves, aye. And it's kind of a... Uh, I hear you've hired this hall out yet. Yeah. Have you got stewards? No. You'll need stewards. Why? Because you've got 350 people there, they're football fans, who are experienced. If you get two football fans in the same room, you may be asking for trouble. All right, I'll get stewards. So it's a few family and friends and they come down. We go and, we go and see the hall on the Friday. And the Jannies are really helpful. I and mean, you, 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 you're never organised a public meeting. You think, oh, let's just do this. But when you actually go down and think, how is this going to work? And the Jani saying to you, so what's going to happen? And you're thinking, I've got no idea what's going to happen. Sure. <laughs> There's a bunch of people coming, they're going to talk, people will listen to them and what's not to like? And he says, well, do you want a table on the stage? And I'm thinking, aye, that'll be good, get us a table on the stage. And he says, have you got a tablecloth? Another surreal moment, have you got a tablecloth? And I'm thinking, aye, I must have a tablecloth somewhere. And I was saying to Kevin earlier, they'd say, my main claim to fame is my tablecloth has been on Scots, but, you know, <laughs> you know, that's when you know you've hit the highlights, you know. So, so tablecloth in hand, everything sorted out. I dropped by and, and, and Sunday, we'd meet was at one o'clock or something on Sunday afternoon. And two of the most helpful journalists were actually Jim Trainer and Hugh Keevens. I know that might sound a bit surprising to Celtic fans that Jim Trainer was, was helpful. He was, he was absolutely great, Jim Trainer. And I dropped by the Herald office that morning to give me tickets to go to Sheriff's. They could have been uh, nicer, could have been more helpful. And, uh, and I think these guys genuinely wanted Celtic sorted out. You know, I don't think there was any kind of, well, we're just letting them die, who cares? I think they were, they were, they were genuinely interested in keeping, in keeping Celtic alive. We go along and we have the meeting and it goes really well and and I've passed some of the footage to Paul so I'm sure Paul's going to do something with the footage. Brian Dempsey spoke for about 30 minutes without a script and he was just outstanding, absolutely outstanding. He had, 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 had the crowd in the palm of his hands. It went really well and then the next day in virtually 
all the papers, it was front page news, save ourselves. Uh, Brian Dempsey says this, says that. And then this is my first kind of time that I'd actually get into this kind of like fake music kind of stuff because people were saying, is this the first start of, is, is this the start of a takeover bid and stuff like that? He said, no, no, it's just a meeting to have a chat about stuff. So, so all this other rubbish was in the paper. I think it's not that at all. All it was was Willie's idea, basically, and it's all down to Willie. He had, he had the idea, was that the fans didn't have a voice. So the official supporters club was, was kind of, how do you get tickets for the big games, basically? And I know over the last six years, you know, words that have been used are things like governance and transparency and accountability and stuff like that. I don't think we used those big words back then, but that's really what it was. It was about saying, well, we don't know what's happening. And the club's going down the toilet. Who's doing something, basically? And that's all that was about. I think all that was about was saying, what's happening and how do we change things? And the board were never going to change things. And still, until you stop giving them money, they were never going to change things. So it was on Scotsport that day. It was on Scotland today. As I said, it was in all the paper, and it ran for a few days, and it made the front page of the Celtic View, which was astonishing. And it was Tom Grant, big, big interview with Tom Grant. These guys are genuine supporters, bloody bloody. Done that, you then say, well, what's, well, what's next? I think I mentioned earlier, it's actually the wee stories that are actually more interesting than the, than the big stories. And the wee stories were, a few months went by, and I think Billy McNeil got sacked in the May, and Terry Cassidy then sacked the Lisbon Lions from their, cos- from their corporate hospitality stuff. So a woman in the work bought the sun, and the sun's lying on this desk, and in the back, there's a thing with Jimmy Johnson. And it says, Jing, it says that Terry Cassidy will kill Celtic. And he said something like, if you put me and Terry on the park at the same time, we know who the fans will, will vote for. And I'm thinking, right, we'll contact Jimmy Johnson and we'll get Jimmy Johnson to lead the campaign because Jimmy Johnson leads the campaign and people will start and take notice. So it's a guy called Lindsay Heron, who's, who's still kicking about, I think, who wrote the piece. So I phoned him and I said, to Jim, we'll save ourselves. And I said, uh, do you have Jinky's phone number? Because, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he said, aye, no bother. And the funny thing, thing was that Jinky's phone number was in the book. Didn't have to, have to ask him for it at all. <laughs> so I phoned, I phoned Jimmy Johnson. And it's quite bizarre. You're phoning Jimmy Johnson, basically. And uh, he wasn't in. I spoke to his son. Who's this, Jim? I'll say for sales. Aye, right. Can you ask your dad to phone me? So this was the Friday. And then the Saturday, about half nine in the morning, the phone goes. And you answer the phone. And it says, can I speak to Jim Moore? Aye, who's this, Jimmy Johnson? And you think, no, no, you're no Jimmy Johnson. Aye. So I explained to Jinky, this was the plan, this is what we do, bloody, bloody, bloody. The club's going down the toilet. It'd be great if you would get to involved. You don't have to do anything, just be a kind of figurehead. We need change, all this kind of stuff. And he said, aye, fine. So I said, do you want to get together? And then he says, aye, well, my local pub's the such and such a place in Oddingston. Uh, what about Tuesday night? And I said, aye, that'll be good, fine. So, so I then tell the other guys, and they say, we want to come, we want to come. No, you can't come because it's just me and Jinky. No, no, I need to come. So Willie Wilson couldn't make it, actually, he was working. But the other three guys in the as well turtle up to, to Uddingston. And he's the centre of attention. No matter where you go, I mean, guys are like, buying them drinks all night type of thing. And he loads of stories. And I took him home that night. And that's my other claim to fame. I took Jimmy Johnson home. And, uh, and nothing much came of that, which was a, which was a shame. Uh, and I, I sent him a few letters about, you know, we could do this and do that. And maybe it wasn't for him or whatever it happened. But, but that was, as I said, the wee things that kind of happened. And then there was a, I think the affiliation had a, had a big meeting in the SECC and we went to that just to see what was getting said. And all the while, what we did was, we had about 350 people who'd written to us and what we'd said to them is, we'd do a newsletter every couple of months to just tell them what we're up to. So we sent a newsletter out every, every couple of months and the plan was to have another meeting and try and get Terry Cassidy along. Mm-hmm. But he wasn't for doing anything, basically. And just to get you into the mind of Terry Cassidy, uh, there was one thing in the Celtic view after the, after the first rally and somebody put this really scathing thing in, you know, save ourselves, forget them, bad guys, blah 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 And then the guy's name and address. So we looked it up and the guy didn't exist, basically. We looked on the electoral rules, didn't exist. So made up stuff. So I wrote to the Celtic view and said, this is made up. You know, you can't do this. this isn't so nothing came back. And I wrote a couple of other letters to the Celtic view and nothing came back. And I thought, what I'll do is... I'll write to them again, but it'll be an anagram of Save Ourselves. And it's actually a really difficult thing to make an anagram of Save Ourselves. It would never make countdown. It's just too difficult. And the anagram was something like Alex Stove Senior. There's another one that was equally as bizarre. And then I did something called Carl Estevez from Bilbao, sort of thing. So Steve C. Rasul, that was one. So two of them got in the Celtic view, and the third one didn't. And we've been writing back and forth to Terry Cassidy. And he sends a letter and he says, uh, you know, your organisation, I'm no interested, blah, 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 blah. It's came to my attention that somebody's written to the Celtic View with an anagram of Save Ourselves. And you're thinking, your job is to get us a stadium. Why are you doing anagrams in the Celtic View? So that kind of, you thought, that's his kind of mindset. But eventually he agreed to come to the next meeting. 
and it was December, so that was February, and then December was the next one. In the interim period, I'd handed my season ticket back, and two other guys were, 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 were season ticket holders in the committee, and it made the evening time. It said the Save Ourselves Committee are handing back their season tickets. So when I first thought of this, back when Brian Dempsey got kicked off the board, I'm thinking, this is a pebble in the ocean. And by the time I did it, actually made the news. I'd actually handed my season ticket back. So we have the one in December, and we managed to, to get Peter Rafferty to come along, who was the head of the affiliated team. He represented you know, seven to 10,000 people. There was a guy called Professor Tom Carberry who'd written a, a piece in the Herald again, and his, his, his beef was a new stadium. And they wrote a very, kind of, a very long, articulate piece on how it was going to be really difficult. And I, I just phoned him to say, would you fancy come along to this meeting as well? He was up for doing that. So we've got Tom Carberry, we've got Peter Rafferty, we've got the jewel in the crown, Terry Cassidy, and we've got Willie Wilson again. Again, fantastic to come along and actually do that again. But it was a funny one. People said this time it won't be speeches, this time it'll be a Q&A. Mm-hmm. So we asked people to send in questions and all that. And both these events were all ticket because we had no idea who was coming. And these things could go off badly. You know, if you put 350 people in the room mm-hmm. and it's my name on the lease for the rent for this thing, and I'm thinking, well, it has to be all ticket. We need to know who's coming so we can check people out. So we get 350 people, no, there's actually more than that wanted to come. We said, no, no, D50 is a limit. That's that. How, how did you vet these people? I know that's they were on our list. Basically, what we did list. was, the people who wanted this newsletter, well, basically what we said to people was, uh, if you want to join this, and what we called it was Independent Celtic Supporters Association, send a couple of quid a year type of thing, just to cover the kind of... I mean, back in the day also, I mean, things like, we used to send these newsletters to 350 people, you know, so it wasn't emails, you know, so we asked them for start addressed envelopes to come in mm-hmm. and, uh, and you were photocopying you are standing at a photocopier forever photocopying this stuff so it wasn't the emails and it wasn't whatever it is these days it was actually quite a labour intensive thing that we did so so 350 people and we asked them along again the media are all because you've got Cassidy and they want you what Cassidy had to say so we made it a Q&A and we asked for people to send in questions and we picked about a dozen questions something like that and, and that was the format that day again STV are there, all the papers are there, they all want to find out about it. And you guys have watched the footage now. Mm-hmm. You kind of played the pantomime villain a wee bit at time, boo hiss type of thing. But also it was quite, I thought it was quite difficult for him as well because on the one hand you're looking at it with your eyes and thinking change, 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 this is bad. But a lot of the information that you were getting were from the papers. And I think as we know now, a lot of information in the papers isn't maybe 100% accurate. Mm-hmm. So I could understand Terry Cassidy then say, well, where'd you get that from? The papers? Well, oof. You don't want to believe everything that's in, that's in the paper. So, so I could understand, I was a bit sympathetic maybe towards him, but he couldn't answer questions as well. But the big, the, the big takeaway is when he said, we'll have the best stadium in Europe within three years. And that was the big takeaway. And that was in every newspaper the following day that we'd have. It was such a ridiculous thing to say, you know. And I think if I was in this, you'd be trying to damp down expectations. Mm-hmm. You'd be trying to say, we'll do what we can. But it's only like Paul McStay was going to leave and how are you, you going to keep Paul McStay and, and, and all this kind of stuff. So I think it was hard for him to do. And I think he did a good job in his own mind about trying to you know, uh, keep all this stuff at bay. Again, it's in all the papers again. And after that, the kind of campaign fizzled out a wee bit. And uh, it was no, never more than 350 people. So if you only get 350 people and the affiliations get 10,000, I don't think that's a mandate to do much. And then what then happened was that the board got wind of what David Lowe was doing. You've had David on your, yeah. on your podcast. Mm-hmm. And David did a phenomenal job hoovering up all these shares. And that was the way to crack it. Because if you get the majority of shares, you can bump these guys. The only other way it's going to do it is if the bank calls in their loans. And I think there was a lot of people at the time, and even now, people look back at it and say things like, well, the bank were a bit biased. You know, they gave loads of money to the team across the river, but didn't give us anything. You don't lend money to companies. You lend money to people, basically. And... You know, would you have lent money to Chris White and Kevin Kelly? No, you wouldn't. No. Would you lend money to David Murray at that time? Absolutely. You know, he ran a number of successful businesses. Maybe that maybe changed a wee bit looking back on it. But at the time, he's a rising star. You would, you would certainly loan him money. So they were never going to loan Celtic that kind of money. And up to the point, they were going to call in at that point. And it was, it was when that was going to happen. And I think that if people had stopped going to the games a bit earlier, a few years earlier, then maybe they'd have stopped it a bit earlier but it dragged on a bit and then what happened I think they brought is it was David Smith I think they brought onto the board early 1992 I think mm-hmm. all the kind of save ourselves off was, was, was 91 that kind of the first rally was a uh, meeting was in February 91 the second one was December 91 and when you fast forward to April 92 February, March April 92 they brought this guy David yeah. David, David Smith on the board mm-hmm. who was a bit more kind of a uh, bit more savvy about him basically and then they came up with this pact whereby mm-hmm. they all signed a pact that says that we will vote with each other 
even if it's to the detriment of the club, we will vote together. And that kind of kind of stopped David Lowe and maybe Brian Dempsey on, you know, thinking, hold on, you know, they've kind of shut the gates a bit. And then there was a meeting one night that, that, that Willie was meant to go to and couldn't make it. And I ended up going, and then Willie came along actually, and Willie was there, and Jerry Dunbar was there, and, and Mark McGlone was there. Mark McGlone's the most enthusiastic guy in the world. So Matt's there, David Lowe's there, Brian Dempsey's there, Tom Gant's there, one or two other people are there. And Brian Dempsey said the word activist at one point, and I'm thinking, who's he talking about? He's an activist. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe I'm an activist. Here, because all I do is kind of write letters and stuff. And, oh, I, I'm an activist now. Right? And then we felt, Willie and I felt, this had went as far as it could go. Right. It had to go into a different kind of level. And Matt was up for that. Matt mm-hmm. was doing the big thing. And what happened subsequent to that, you've got... You know, Matt and the guys outside the Bank of Scotland getting and opening mm. accounts and shutting accounts and all that kind of really high profile stuff. And really that wasn't for us. It was more about, you know, a kind of gentle persuasion, you know. So when you look back to the association, you've mentioned how well supported they were, Jim. Were they letting the Celtic fans down in terms of being a voice against the board? What was their attitude at that time? You've got the Celtic Supporters Association, which would have been George Delaney at that yep. time, would have been. You've and, and you've got the affiliation, which was Peter Rafferty. Yep. To give a bit of outline to the two, the Celtic Supporters Association were mainly for Glasgow-based Celtic supporters, mm-hmm. and the affiliation were for out with Glasgow. So I think, I mean, from my from point of view, we didn't really know what was happening within the support of the, within the official supporters. All you knew, the club was kind of going down the toilet at some point. So was somebody going to do something to try and stop it? And then when you, when you think of my season tickets, though, you think, well, they've got all the tickets. It's not going to season ticket holder. So maybe maybe that was the focus. And at the end of the day, the other thing is that I think is the vast majority of football fans just, going to watch, just want to go and watch the football. They're not interested in all the machinations that go in behind it basically it's just the football and the football's okay that was it and in fact I think uh, in that time there was, a, there, was, there was a semi-final against Rangers at that time when Rangers were down to 10 men after 10 minutes and, and Celtic pummeled them and uh, should have had a penalty or two and, and hit the bar a few times and lost the game one nothing. and I think if we'd have won that game it was Airdrie in the final and we'd have won the final and I think Liam Brady would have got more time then and I think mm-hmm. this, is a, this is just would have just lumbered on a few years you know so things mm. had to get worse before they get better because when they get worse people will stop going and once people stop going that's when the bank will start getting twitchy to say look you owe a lot of money here you know and if I'm the bank I'd be saying get rid of McStay get rid of Collins get rid of Park Bonner sell these guys give them money back that's what I'd do that, that'd be the sensible thing to do and you thought that's going to happen that's just around the corner and then Fergus McCann got involved and again another bizarre thing Fergus McCann phoned me one day during 1991 uh, just to find out about the campaign what's going on daddy dad keep me posted type of thing and he'd been chapping at the door for a number of years as I think you know he'd, he'd offered them interest free loans he'd offered them a whole lot of stuff and, he, and he'd knocked everything back and Fergus I think chucked it at one point and just thought that's me finished I'm not going back and then when things got really bad he came in and saved the club and there was loads of talk about there was a number of people who could have saved it he did it he came in and he put the money down on the table, no guarantees, nothing. He did it. He saved the club. And that's and where we are just now, to me, that's all done to Fergus McCann. You mentioned that you didn't think you had a mandate only having 350 on your mailing list. Yeah. I remember you handing out the flyers, yep. uh, the first flyers against Hearts. What was the reaction like when you were handing out the flyers? Mixed, <laughs> to, say the, to say the least. Some guys were saying, oh, you go, son, that's really good. Some place just, uh, the other guy just ripped up and said, right, a bunch of bloody blah type of thing, support the team. Type of thing. So uh-huh. again, that's that's this idea of, of I mean, the three of us are chatting here, and if you pick a subject, the three of us have different views about it. So you're not going to convince everyone, and what you can hope to do is convince enough people that this is something that was maybe worth looking at. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, you always knew, it. like everything else in life, whether you like it or not, it comes down to pound notes. You said it fizzled out the the campaign that you set up, but did that lay the foundations for another group? To step in, did it raise the awareness, Jim? I think, the I, fan think, base? I think, I think Matt took that on really, really well. And the fanzines, I mean, from the, the fanzines from the very start were all anti board. So, so all the various fans that were kicking about, not at the view and once a Tim and all that stuff, we kind of extended that a wee bit, I think, by saying, let's have a few meetings, let's get involved with media. And I think Matt then extended that further, took it on to a different level, I think. At the end of the day, it was all down to money, mm-hmm. you know. And as soon as the money ran out, something would happen. And it's just, it's a shame it took so long to actually happen. And then, the more you found out about it, the more they found out that the board themselves were not interested in moving. They, they, they had no interest at all. And then when you, hear, when you listen to Fergus McCann talking about how much they had to pay to pay these guys off, it was all about self-preservation at the end yeah. of the day. And maybe, again, at the end of the day, if you were in their shoes, would you do the same thing? You know, who knows? You, you know the meeting you had where David Lowe was there, Brian Dempsey, yeah. Matt McGlone? Who was driving that? 
did it, it sounds as though it was maybe David Lowe and Brian Dempsey. No, it was a kind of general meeting in terms of because David Smith had come on the board, I think they were stuck on the wagons a wee bit. And that was just a kind of general chat. But stuff. I don't think anyone was, 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 was driving it as such. It was more like kind of here's people that are involved in this. Kind of, I think it was maybe their meeting and they thought, well, maybe ask the activists along and we'll get their views of things and what goes next. And, and as I said, Matt was really enthusiastic. And then, as I said, Matt took that one to a different level. And then we thought, well, that's good. Well, Matt's, you know, on you go. That's good. So we did a wee bit. Matt takes it on, does his bit, Fergus comes along, saves the club, and just, just a shame it wasn't maybe a few years earlier, because but then things worked out okay in terms of stopping the 10. So. Um, Pat Woods, famous Celtic historian, uh-huh. he's been quoted as saying that there's been other protests, Celtic fans have had protests in 1897 when we became a, when we became a limited company. Uh-huh. Um, there was ones in 1963, I can remember that the, I think they used to have I think they had to call in horses uh-huh. to clear people away from the main stand. Uh-huh. Pat Woods says that in the nineties, the working class man was more educated, mm-hmm. and that's how, even though the board had been probably not the best for the football club for how many no, years? Well, yeah. By the time we got to the nineties, the Celtic fans were more intelligent, for the want of a better word. Mm-hmm. And you had guys like yourself, who was an accountant, had guys like David Lowe who are big financial people. Mm-hmm. Do you think that played a part, that the fact that the Celtic sport were more educated? I don't know. Or were, or were, or were we just in a bleak situation? I don't know. I, mean, I, think, I, think, I think at the end of the day, it, it was all about trying to get the board to listen and to try and communicate with the board, and I don't think they were for listening. So whether you were the most educated... I mean, David was a clever guy, mm. and they just blanked him. Dempsey, McCann, all these guys, and Wisefield and Hawking, all these guys, they were lining up to give them money and they knocked them all back. So I don't think it was anything to do with how clever people were. I just think that they were pretty much entrenched in terms of what they were doing. They weren't going to be moved. It would take something seismic to actually make things happen, and that's what happened in ninety four when the bank called them in. Maybe the point I was maybe trying to make was the way the protests were. Protests used to be just outside the main stand and the police were charging with the, the horses. Aye. Now you had the protests, like yourselves, 350 people in shelves in town hall. Loads of press and Matt and guys like that going into the banks, opening accounts, shutting accounts. I think I think at any of that time, if we'd have won the league at any of that time, the fans would still come back and then the board would be happy to just stay where they are. And it was all about, as I said earlier, what happens on the park. And I think, you know, if, if in 1990, I mean, most of those years we never get close, basically. Mm-hmm. But if there's one year we actually won the league, I think for the majority of fans, that I think I just want to watch the football in the park. We've won the league. We're the, we're the best team in the country we're coming back to watch and we'll, win, and we'll win the European Cup this year and we'll do all this Aye. kind of stuff and I think that would have put it back I think things had to get worse before they get better and I think if I'm the board I'd be saying well these guys are still turning up and they're giving me the money mm-hmm. where's my incentive to, to walk away from this and if you're one of the family dynasties that's been there since the start why would you want to give that up so I can understand that if you look at it from their point of view why what's going to happen to make me give this up the bank are chasing me for money, well, that's a good reason. Or we no longer have enough shares, we've got less than 50%, mm, we're kind of stuffed. And that's the only way it was ever going to change. I totally get the point of maybe a more educated fan base mm-hmm. and all this kind of stuff, but if I'm, if I'm Kevin Kelly, if I'm Chris White, you keep giving me money, where's my incentive to go? You know, And I think that's what... One of the points that you made earlier on was if the team were winning, yep. then that was fine. And I think that was entrenched in the, the affiliations and the associations uh-huh. uh, thinking. Yeah. When Brady was sacked, first game after Brady was sacked, we went to Ibrox uh-huh. and won two one with Frank Connor in charge. Yep. Then I think when McCarry took over, eh, we went on a fifteen game unbeaten run. Yeah. Where Save Ourselves was. Mm-hmm. There was a number of periods where we went unbeaten yep. and it looked like we turned the corner. Yeah. And as football fans, we are fickle people. Absolutely. And if we're winning, we think everything's fine. Took the Absolutely. heat off. Took the heat, took the heat off, the off the board. The board. Uh-huh. Absolutely. And you also think, again, that football being the nature of the game, 11 guys against 11 guys, if you get a season where things go for you, and you know you may upset the odds, and uh, and there's been various seasons, the, the, the two most obvious ones to me were the centenary season, mm-hmm. Where we've really no right to win the league, and then the, the year we stopped to ten, we'd absolutely no, no, no right to win those leagues, given the financial disparity. I think, but we did. So there was no reason to think that at some point in the early nineties we might have won the league. And I think that's what every fan would want. We're going to win the, You start every season thinking you're going to win the league this year, and if you win the league, then everything else doesn't matter because mm. you're the best team in the country. 
But what's happened in the early 90s, they were getting further and further and further right. away. You know, we're losing by, you know, 15, 16 points or something like that. So that was, how are you going to solve this? And then the team across the city are spending more and more money, and you're not, and then you're struggling to bring in players who you would think are not very good. So it's a downward spiral, and it can only end up in one way. I think know? if we bring it forward to just now, you mentioned football governance earlier on in that as well. There's a lot of Celtic fans don't know what Resolution 12 is. Of course, yeah. They don't know the majority of the stuff that guys like Phil and James Forrest and that talk about yep. every day on their blogs yep. because we're winning. Yep. And they have no interest whatsoever other yep. than going to Celtic Park every fortnight and watching a successful football yep. team. And that's totally understandable, absolutely. Um, I think that, yeah, I'm, I'd like yourself, possibly spend far too much time on the blogs with kind of Phil Mack and Quick News and Celtic and E Tims and all that kind of stuff. Because again, the communication nowadays compared to what it was, you know, 27, 28 years ago, is just ridiculous. I mean, if you wanted to, you could you could spend all day, every day reading about stuff online about Celtic, listening to stuff like this podcast, and watching stuff on Celtic TV mm. on YouTube, you know, just. It's like science fiction. If you said to us 27 years, you can do this in 27 years, you think you're off your head. You, you, you shouldn't, it's, just, it's bonkers, you know. So it would have been a different campaign now to what it was back then, a completely different campaign until you would, how you'd manage that. And, and, and obviously what's happened across the city, you can see what's happened in the past few years. There's been one or two guys have put their head above, above the parapet and tried to do something. And it's actually really difficult when you do that. And that's why I admired Willie Wilson so much, because he got a lot of stick. You know, he says, I'm going to start a campaign, I'm not happy about this. And that was his opinion. And you're going to have half the fan base thinking, who is this guy? What's he doing? And Matt McGowan suffered the same stuff as well. Who is this guy, Matt McGowan, doing all this kind of stuff? But what he wanted to do is try and do something, as opposed to howling at the moon. As I said before, I went to the papers and, and, and I did a wee thing. When the campaign finished, I, I wrote to Not The View again. Not The View were brilliant. Not The View at any time. Edition, every edition of Not The View, they all put someone in about Save Ourselves. And when we finished up, I put someone in. And it ended up with something like, you know, if you really want to change things, then you need to do something. You can't really sit back. And what does, what does do something? Well, do something actually just write a letter to the board. Could you buy a stamp? Could you buy a stamp and write a letter to the board? Just let them know how you feel. But for most fans, as I said earlier, it's about what happens on the park. So the board and all this kind of stuff. And I think nowadays, because of the, the internet, we're all far more aware of what's happening. But just to take mm-hmm. your point, Kevin, I think, you know, you could say 50, 60% of the Celtic fans out there are no interested or... I don't know about all the shenanigans that's been happening and it's a fascinating story on so many levels from a football level governance legal financial blah, social, blah, 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 level, social well. level social and level and to me it's like I can have it's almost like I can have a soap opera because you're looking at it next, what's happening next what's that happened you know I don't it's think, fascinating for me I don't think save ourselves or selves for change would happen now they wouldn't have time to evolve I mean, for me, it's quite... There's a link between Save Ourselves and Sales for Change. Uh-huh. But now, if somebody started a campaign within three minutes of it being on social media, everybody uh-huh. knows everything about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's no time for it to evolve, no time for it to That's grow. A fair point. Yeah. And it would get crushed. Because, as you say, you were meeting guys who were going, I'm not interested in your leaflet. Right. Now you would have thousands of voices online yeah. right away telling you, that I'm not that and that's, that's why I think, that's Kevin, that's why I think it's really difficult in that, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of dead easy to sit over here. I mean, we're going through a most successful period in a while and we're looking over the city and thinking they've got loads of problems. But actually, how do you solve the problems? It's actually difficult. You know, the one or two guys that put their head above the parapet, they're getting that kind of stuff. So how do you actually change things that are not going too well? I think it's a it's a fascinating story on so many levels, you know. And there's a, you look back to it so when, when we did this or, Matt did these sales for change. How would that work in the modern environment? Mm. Really difficult. I think you're right. I don't mm. think it would work. Yeah. We've been lucky enough, me and Paul, have seen the videos that you've gave us. Uh-huh. And the videos are a fantastic watch. You're, you're watching these videos and you're, and you're going like that. I know him. I know him. I know that guy. We spotted Stevie Murray in the crowd. We did with hair. Yes. <laughs> but it's very hard to watch them through without actually knowing what happened. Without uh-huh. knowing the end game. Yeah, and when you see Brian Dempsey talking, because mm-hmm. we are going to put them out, when you see Brian Dempsey talking, he's still mentioning things at that point that are still getting spoke about today. British yeah. leagues, better facilities. Terry Cassidy. Terry was you, you called him a pantomime villain. Mm-hmm. I just thought he was contemptuous and evasive, uh-huh. and the the video doesn't make very good viewing. Uh-huh. But when you read reports at that time, 
Terry mm-hmm. came out that meeting quite well. Absolutely. Yeah. And when for me watching that the other night there, I'm going, how could anyone left that hall believe in a word that man said? I think again, you're getting back to uh, what information did the fans get back then? They got it from the papers. Mm. So how much of that was true? How much of that was false? And again, and I'm trying to play devil's advocate with this thing. If you're Terry Cassidy and you're you're challenged with trying to kind of turn Celtic round and some of the other videos that I've sent on were, were stuff I've taped from like STV and BBC and he does an interview and he says something like and he might have said this on the day he said everything I've looked at needs to be looked at sorry everything I've seen has to be looked at and you're thinking how how bad a state were they in basic things they brought Peter Law on board as, as an accountant and he came in there to change the financial systems because they didn't have financial systems and you're thinking a club the size of Celtic and then when you actually looked at their, their accounts over a period of time, what well, was fascinating by was something like, I think in 1979, we had a, we had a, we had a turnover of 700 grand in 1979, which went to something like 7 million by 1990. So it didn't take in much money, and without knowing too much about the inner workings, you're thinking, what he's just said, Terry Cassidy, means that it's a bit of a shambles in there, and he has to sort stuff out. So that was a huge challenge, I think, for him, and I think he was obviously trying to do his best, he's not going in there to, not to try and do his best, and try and, try and, try and turn the club, the club around. So I was sympathetic mm-hmm. up to a point because the point was getting them there and he agreed to come and answer questions the best you can. And yes, he was a bit of a pantomime villain. He's one of these guys you think, well, if you were down the pub having a pint with him, it'd be really good for him, you know, but he's the chief executive of Celtic, so you expect him to maybe say things a bit different and deal with things a wee bit differently. But I, again, I'm trying to play devil's advocate and all this kind of stuff. I'm trying to see both views. It was good that he came. It's good that he answered some of the questions. Some of the... Some of the ways he answered the questions mm-hmm. could have maybe uh, left a bit to be desired, but hey ho, you know, the whole point of the exercise was get him along, ask him some questions, and see what. And you were never going to solve all the problems no, no. in that day. It was a matter of just raising the profile again, keeping it going. Because what we said at the very start of this thing, the, the, the point of the campaign was to try and get some form of communication. And any time we did uh, get in touch with Terry Cassidy, he was all for that. It's all for, for, you know, this. We should have more open communication. We should be doing this and should be doing that. Whether he did it or not. That's a different thing, but yeah. um, as I say, it's difficult to watch it. So my view of Cassidy is already coloured. You're not a fan. <laughs> no, it's, it's already co- coloured by what I remember at that time, being Aye. 16 at that time. And you that young, goodness sake. <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the other thing about Cassidy was he was speaking about fake news. You were talking about Dempsey talking about what's relevant now. I was, and Cassidy was talking about uh, fake news, and he's probably Aye. as popular as the guy that's talking about that now as well. Yeah. Now, Jim, you got your season ticket back after the takeover. I did. Um, yeah. And since then, you've been involved in some more creative uh, endeavours. Could you tell us a wee bit about those, please? Yeah. Well, my my kind of my kind of main pastime for about twenty years or so was actually running kids' football. That's what I did, and I would encourage all your listeners to go out and start a football team at school one of my big hobby horses is the fact that the reason that Scottish football is so poor is we don't actually have enough football activities for young kids and I don't know if you guys have got kids or not but I'd say all your listeners volunteer to take a football activity at your local primary school that's my message for today basically but anyway I did that for 20 years and I stopped that about 6 years ago and I'd always fancied maybe having a go at writing so I started writing and sitcoms has always been my kind of thing so I spent a couple of years writing a sitcom I thought I'd come up with an original sitcom uh, I mean, that's a long story of cutting that for now. I went to see a play called Selts in Seville in 2008. Tony Roper wrote it, uh, really funny, very good about the Seville season. And my sister's a, an actress, singer, sometimes producer. So she produced it along with Celtic. And because she knows nothing about football, she was tapping into me for, can you get me strips? Can you get me a bow of Easter scarf? Can you get me all this kind of stuff? So, And because football fans are very particular about this stuff, you can't get the wrong strips, you know, so... The Seville season with the NTL was most of the season, then the Carling strips at the end type of thing. So I got my name in the programme, Jim Moore helped. So this is this is show business, basically. And what you do with these things to sound a bit show busy is that uh, when you've written a script, uh, you have something called a read through, a table tabletop reading. And Tony Roper said to my sister, Do you want to ask Jim along because he'd been a big help? So I go along with this, this, this table read, and it was fascinating seeing a script. And it was only about 65 pages. It's only about, you know, you know, not a lot of words. I mean, I mean that's a that's a Short email for me, you know, it's nothing to it, and I'm thinking, I could do this. this is so that, that, that planted a wee seed basically. So in 2014, four years ago, I thought, I'm going to write a football play, a football comedy. That's, 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 that's my new thing. And I thought, I'll do the 50th anniversary of Lisbon. And I thought, everyone will do the 50th anniversary of Lisbon. People who actually do this for a living will do that. So I left that one be. But I was fascinated with the whole 1967 stuff. And as I said earlier, I'm a big Scotland fan. 
And Scotland's most famous victory was Wembley, 67, beating on 3 2, who were the World Cup champions, the World Cup holders at the time. So, and it was fascinating doing it and doing all the research for it and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and that was a, fin- that was a fin- I mean, I was, I was only eight then, so I didn't understand all the stuff that was happening. So, the social changes, political changes, fashion, music, football, and that was the high mark. I mean, Lisbon, obviously, but Rangers got to the Cup Winners' Cup final. For your younger listeners, there's something called the Intercities Fairs Cup, which is the equivalent of the Europa League. Command got to the semi final, and you imagine Command getting the semi final of the Europa League. Uh, bonkers. Done United beat Barcelona home and away in that season. So, there was all these things happening. So, I write this play. And I've never written a play before, and I'm thinking this is the funniest thing ever. Why are people not wanting to produce this? This is really good. And I hawk it around, and nobody's interested. So to try and get a bit of interest, I set a website up, and I was going to try and get people at the game to give me some stories and all this kind of stuff. And uh, buying memorabilia, you know, you know, you know signed photographs, programs, and all this kind of stuff. And then I got a lead. There's, there's, there's two very iconic photographs at the end of Wembley sector. There's a guy with Dennis Law, he's got his hand drawn Law, and two guys with Baxter. And I thought, here's an idea. I'm going to try and find these three fans. It must be in the 70s or 80s. And my mates think I'm bonkers. I'm stalking old men, basically. That's <laughs> what I'm doing. That's what it comes down to. And I found a guy with law, and he lives out in East Cobride. So I go out and interview him. I've got my dictaphone and all this kind of I've got a website, and I write up this piece about this guy. His name's Peter Dallas. He played with Atlantic. But I can't find the guys with Baxter. And I hit on an idea to try and publicise the play was that wouldn't it be great in the 50th anniversary to find the two guys with Baxter? And it was the winter break, the start of 2017, which is going to be the 50th anniversary. And the papers are desperate for any kind of football stuff at that point. So I send an email to about 30 papers and say... You're an activist, be... Jim, I'm an activist, <laughs> I, I can't help it. So I send this to 30 papers and say, wouldn't it be great to find these two guys, by the way, I've to play, sort of thing, you know. And the record came back straight, and I know, I know again, the record's not a big, uh, it's not too good with the Celtic fans, but the record came back straight away. And I got, and I, and I got a, two piece, a two-page piece in the record... And then I get a one-page piece in the record. And then basically get that off the ball got in touch with me. So I'm on off the ball. I get a, I get a one-page in Scotland on the Sunday. I've got all this publicity. I don't actually have a play put on. So, and I was desperate to put it on last year because it's the 50th anniversary of the thing. And then I went to see something called The, the Lions of Lisbon. And this was written for the 25th anniversary by Bertie Old's brother, Ian Old, who since passed away, and a guy called Professor Willie Maley, who you've heard of. And it's on Oren Moore. And it was called a rehearsed reading, and I'd never heard of something called a rehearsed reading. So I go along and see this thing, and basically there's ten guys, and there's ten people on the stage, and they stand up, and they've got the script, and they, and they, and they just talk, and then they sit down. No set, uh, no costume, nothing. And that was like a light bulb moment. I thought, because it was going to be too expensive to actually do this myself. Mm. You know, how much did it cost to do that? It would still cost a few bob, but I thought, I can do that. So I did that last November. So the play was called Bender Like Baxter, basically, and... Feedback was really good. Andrew Smith wrote some really nice things about the ex-Celtic View guy. But the plan was always to write a Celtic comedy play. And basically, I do the Wembley 67 ones. You get to 2018, so you've got such a choice then. Because I'm thinking, every year I'm going to write a Celtic comedy play that commemorates an anniversary. And so you get to 2018, what's your choice? Go back 10 years, Tommy Burns Thursday. Oh, that's worth it, I've played. 20 years, stop at 10. Yes. Centenary season? 88, yeah. 78, no, 68, won the league. No. So your choices are those three. And then again, when you do all the research, you read up all this stuff, really there's only one one you're going to do, and that's stopping the 10. And basically, I think amongst a lot of fans next to Lisbon, because of the consequences of that, that's the one to do. So I was trying to think of a good name for it. I didn't want to be too triumphant, like, you know, Cheerio 10 in a row or Smell the Glove or any that kind of stuff. And I quite like the idea of bend it like something and have a series of that type of thing. So I'm thinking, it'd be good to have a bend that like something starting with a B and two syllables. <laughs> and then the moment that we knew the 10 was stopped was when Harold scored. And you think, well, that's a gift. Thank you very much. So bend the light brought it back, basically. So that's this year's play, and it's on Webster's Theatre on the 5th and 6th of October. Webster's holds less than 200 people, you know, so it's not a big, fancy Celtic the Musical, which is on the pavilion for four weeks, and there's 15 people. It's a kind of small-scale thing, but the feedback I've had, I've sent it to various people, uh, it's quite funny. Uh, it's a Celtic thing. If you're a Celtic fan, you'll love it. There's lots of reference to that season. They're at the various games, so you're writing at the game type of thing. And it, and it's quite, again, you're thinking they had no right to win that league that season. And the more you look at all the games, and what I did is mm-hmm. I set up a page, like in a Facebook page, sorry, Ben Lee Brat Back page, and I've got links to all the games that season and links to all the Celtic wikis and put a lot of other stuff on it. I mean, you watch all the games and the bought the various books, you know, you've got the Inner Sanctum by Mark Greedy, the Glory Boys. 
I bought about 30 Celtic views and you, you, you're scaring the fans. So you're just getting kind of lots of information basically back then. And they'd absolutely no right to win that no. league. And if you think back, the Dunfermline game, the second game against Dunfermline when we, when we, when we lost 2-1, I have never been at a more, I've never been at a game where the level of abuse was so much. You know, if you think back to that game, we just lost <coughs> the Hibs, and then Andy Tom scored in the first half, one up, and then Dunfermline scored straight away at the start. And Dunfermline could have scored five that day. They hit the post and the bar. And the vitriol that was coming down from the stands. So, so that's in it. You know, boo this, boo, just constant booing. Type. And then obviously things get better from that. And, then, and there's ups and there's downs and there's all this kind of stuff. So it was a fascinating season in so many levels. And... Uh, as I said, so that's that's this year's play. Next year's play, that's going to be the 40th anniversary of stopping of uh, 10 men won the league. That'll be next year's one type of thing. So this is the idea to try and write a play each year and if it's not going to cost me too much, then actually stage a play every year. So that's that's what I'm up to just now, Paul. Yeah. 24 players participated in that particular season and uh, again, looking back on, on all these kind of key games and all the key goals, the number of one-goal victories, the number of last-goal victories and all come down to the last day. And even, even when the... And the day they signed Harold, you're thinking, why are they signing this guy? Because he's a counter-attacking guy. And we, I thought at the time we needed a big Pierre type of person to, to play alongside Larson. And uh, I also remember Wim Janssen's face the day we signed Harold. He looked as if he wasn't bothered. He was like, I've signed this guy. But then you saw when he scored the goals against St. Johnson, that's what he could do. And actually, you're on YouTube. He scored a brilliant goal in the San Siro when Rosenberg beat AC Milan. He scored a brilliant goal when they beat Real Madrid. Mm-hmm. So he was always a player. And, uh, but it's that kind of unlikely hero that comes in because he obviously missed a, he missed a barrel with a chance in a lot of the games you know? well, so it was that kind of you know, that kind of unlikely hero kind of stuff you know, the fact he didn't start the game again and there's all these wee things you know and Wim brings him on after an hour and he gets the goal sort of thing. so it's a kind of uh, as I said we absolutely no right to win the league nah, you're always chucked away I know. almost but, uh, and again that was down to Fergus everything that's happened I think is down to Fergus he didn't do that all the stuff with Brendan and all this kind of stuff, that, that was that was the Fergus. This is the legacy. Well, mm-hmm. Jim Moore, the only thing that's left for us to say is thank you very much for being our special guest today and we look forward to Bend the Light Brat back. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers, guys.